hi, welcome to Christ Church today, the 30th of May, Trinity Sunday. Uh, we're celebrating the Holy Trinity at all our services. Um, thank you for joining us. We really hope and pray that you'll be blessed uh, as we meet together and we worship, whether it's online or in person. We're also doing a little bit of a campaign at the moment, encouraging people to come back to church. It really is important physically to get back into church if you can, if you've got children as well, to bring them along into our programs, particularly at 10.30 where we have ample provision uh, for children. But also don't forget the 6.30 service, move forward to 6 o'clock to make it a bit more family friendly as well. As it's Trinity Sunday, I'm going to do a prayer celebrating that God is three persons, God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Almighty and eternal God, you have revealed yourself as Father, Son and Holy Spirit and live and reign in the perfect unity of love. Hold us firm in this faith that we may know you in all your ways and evermore rejoice in your eternal glory one God, three persons. Amen. God bless. Well, good morning and welcome to our service of Holy Communion here at Christ Church. I'm David Hall, the vicar, and it's uh, good to be with you today. We begin our service with the prayer of preparation. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may truly love you and worthily praise your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, the first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Lord, have mercy on us and incline our hearts to keep your laws. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. We pause for a moment before we join together in the words of the confession. To 
together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on us. Pardon and deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and keep us in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Good morning, everyone. I'm Kevin Shaw, and I'd like to lead us through a different aspect of our worship now as we approach God through our intercessions. And this is an opportunity not only to ask God for things, but also to listen. And so I will leave some space in which you can listen to see if God is prompting you in anything as a response to our prayers. So we start now coming for the Lord, and we lift the world. We lift troubled areas of the world, and particularly, we lift the troubled lands of Israel. And despite the ceasefire and the conflict still spilling over uh, against um, Arabs and Jews, with one pitted against the other, Lord, this isn't your way. And so we ask for godly insight and intervention. We also lift you the tensions around Belarus at the moment long-running but now escalating and Lord we see the world more widely becoming more unstable and we ask not just for the people in other countries to intervene but for you to show us how you might want us to intervene whether in prayer or other practical forms and we lift to you all the regions of the world where COVID-19 or ongoing conflict has upended society, and where there is still economic blight, poverty, homelessness, and hunger. And we ask you to encourage and protect all those who are providing aid in practical forms, that they may act with mercy and compassion. And we ask for wisdom and generosity in those who support relief organisations, both practically and in prayer. So, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we lift to you our nation and all those in authority with difficult decisions to make in the face of conflicting advice and increasing media scrutiny. So grant our Prime Minister and our politicians, both national and local, wisdom and godly counsel in their decision-making. And bless Elizabeth, our Queen, that she may be a channel for your gifts of astute judgment and perceptive advice. We thank you for the gift of scientific insight, and in particular the provision of vaccines. We ask for the wisdom in leaders in how to deploy them, not just in our country, but globally. And in our own community, we seek your protection as our society manages the easing of restrictions and the opportunity to meet those they love. And we particularly lift to you both businesses and employees who remain in economic hardship. Give us wisdom and compassion where our own choices could make a difference. So Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we seek your protection for us, our families and friends. Help us to trust more in your unfailing love, to overcome fear and uncertainty. Give us discernment for your greater plan, where our lives remain disrupted, or where compassion is needed in supporting others. And so let us conclude by saying the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, 
hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And so we now come to our reading, which today is from Matthew chapter 9, verses 18 to 26. And I'm reading from the English Standard Version. While he was saying these things to them, behold, a ruler came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. And Jesus rose and followed him with his disciples. And behold, a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for twelve years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. For she said to herself, If only I touch his garment, I will be made well. And Jesus turned, and seeing her, he said, Take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. And when Jesus came to the ruler's house, and he saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, Go away, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in, and he took her by the hand, and the girl arose. And the report of this went through all that district. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, everyone. I wonder if you noticed the very first few words of that passage says that Jesus was already talking, but he was then interrupted. What he'd been saying before our passage was read was talking about bringing newness. He was talking about new wine in new skins. It was an illustration of the coming kingdom of God. But then he was interrupted. And that newness that he'd been talking about was about to be demonstrated in three miracles, two of which we're going to look at together this morning. All the beneficiaries were insignificant people. A sick woman, a young girl, and, as you'll hear next week, two blind men. All were classified as Amcharats, people of the land, who could never be regarded as holy. Rabbis would completely disregard them, but Jesus cared for the despised and for the outsider. His new thing, the kingdom of God, with the promise of eternal life, was to be fully open to all. The new was coming, but it was to be accessible only through faith. The first to be healed in our passage was a woman who had been suffering from bleeding for some 12 years already. Her condition made her ceremonially unclean, as laid down in the book of Leviticus. She was an untouchable outcast, a pariah. The next was a young girl. She was the daughter of a man of local status. He was a leader of the synagogue whose name, Luke's Gospel tells us, was Jairus. But as a child, she was of no account outside the family. But now she was dead, and so her immediate burial was essential, as she was both ritually unclean and a health risk. Let's think about the woman first. Imagine her situation as a social outcast kept at a distance by everyone. And yet she somehow had heard about a healer and knew he was in town. Could he possibly give her a way out of her misery? 
verse 21, she says, if only I touch his cloak, I will be healed. That sounds like a, a superstitious belief in a magic cure. But to her, it was worth a try. Anything was worth a try. And somehow she managed to reach Jesus. No sooner had she managed to touch his cloak and before she could slip away, as I'm sure she was longing to do, Jesus stopped in his track. And as Matthew tells us in the next verse, he turned and saw her. Take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. The woman's recovery, as Jesus spoke words of healing, was life-changing for her. But as well as celebrating her newfound health, we need to notice the words that Jesus used. Firstly, he said, take heart, daughter. Those were perhaps the first friendly words addressed to her in all those 12 years. Before that, she would have had taunts and shouts of keep away, shouts of derision. Take heart, daughter. What a greeting, contravening all the rules, but typical of Jesus. What a compelling model Jesus gives us here for Christian behavior and attitudes towards others. We all know some of the fault lines in society, and if some of those divisions have been under the radar in the past, they are unspoken no longer. Those issues are high on our agenda nationally and internationally, and rightly so too. Paradoxically, of course, their high profile may serve to widen some of those divisions for a time. So it's all the more important that we as individual Christians and as a church community do what we can to bridge them. Do we dare ask ourselves that simple but profound question, what would Jesus do? I think we know the answer. It's demonstrated for us in this passage. He would reach out despite the rules, despite the expectations, despite the fear of opposition. What, about, what opportunities can we find to show practical Christian love to those on the other side of some of those divisions? Divisions of inequality, faith, ethnicity, and more besides. Can we take opportunities? No, let's say this. Can we make opportunities to interact in a positive way, people? Can we find a take heart daughter moment, a take heart brother moment? It doesn't have to be more than that, a friendly greeting, a moment like that for those we meet. Whether we meet them in the workplace, whether we meet them out and about, in shops, in health service settings, our neighbors, even here in church, perhaps. If we can, we should get to know some of those people who are not PLU, people like us. At least say hello in a friendly way. Now, I know very well that there's apprehension. There's even fear on both sides of each of these divides. And I know it's not easy for some to step out like this, but I really believe it's important for the church and Christians to be in the front line and not to abandon the issue to politics and pressure groups. And I'm not now talking about direct evangelism. I'm talking to myself as much as to anyone else about basic, friendly interactions that should be part of everyday human life, let alone in the normal outworking of Christian living. But intentionally going out, being prepared to try to bridge some of those fault lines. So Jesus said, take heart, daughter. But then it got even better for her. Your faith has healed you, he said. And the woman was healed at that moment. Your faith has healed you. The word of Jesus healed her. I wonder if we might fight, feel entitled to ask Jesus, what faith? What faith did she show? If it was faith, it didn't seem to amount to much from what the Gospels tell us. Where was any repentance, any sense of understanding the kingdom of God that Jesus was bringing? Did she even know his name? We may have seen a glimpse of some sort of folk superstition, 
that the clothing of a good person could heal. But was that really faith in Christ? Now, we'll come back to that question in a moment. But first, let's move on to the healing of the, da- of the synagogue leader's daughter. I'll read the passage or the, those bits of the passage. While Jesus was speaking, this is verse 18, a synagogue leader came and knelt before him and said, my daughter has just died, but come and put your hand on her and she will live. Jesus got up and went with him and so did his disciples. Now then we get the interruption of the woman's woman's healing and then they continue to the house. When Jesus entered the synagogue leader's house and saw the noisy crowd and the people playing pipes, he said, go away, the girl is not dead but asleep. But they laughed at him. After the crowd had been put outside, he went in, took the girl by the hand and she got up. Now again, let's imagine the scene. We know that the death of a child is probably the worst thing that can happen to anyone. And Jairus had already proved that that was the case for him. As a pillar of the establishment, he had been so desperate that he risked public humiliation as he threw himself to his knees in front of this vagabond itinerant preacher. A preacher whom he knew was treated by contempt and antagonism by the authorities. Now at the house, the girl is not dead, but asleep, says Jesus, as he expels the crowd who jeered at him as they went. They were required, when a death happened, you you were obliged in rabbinical teaching that you should employ mourners and uh, pipe players, and that was all happening. They jeered as they went. But then almost as an anticlimax, Matthew simply tells us, Jesus took her by the hand, and she got up, breaking the ceremonial rules, of course, as he did so. Now, the woman with bleeding had been healed of her condition through what Jesus called her faith, though we didn't see much of it other than superstition. The young girl was then raised to death through the desperate last resort of her father. And this time, Jesus makes no mention of faith, But it does make me wonder what faith is needed for a miracle to take place then and now. Now, there are conflicting answers to that question. And to the extent that I have an answer, I'm not going to air it now. Faith, prayer and healing are a particularly personal issue for me. And a few minutes in the pulpit is not the time or place to take it nearly far enough. As many of you know, Judy, my wife, and I have a daughter, Rachel, who's been close to death more times than I care to remember over the last 45 years or so. Many people across the world have prayed faithfully for her life and her healing over those years. And today she is alive, but life is very hard for her, largely due to collateral damage from surgery, some of which were successful, some of which were not. On occasions in the past, we and she have been told that our lack of faith accounts for her continuing pain. I don't believe that is the case, at least not in my better moments. But the whole business of faith is at the top of my list of questions when I get to heaven. Perhaps I should just add that Rachel's comment on all this, as she keeps going, is that it is all for her good and for God's glory. Now, one of my commentaries on this passage may help us about this whole faith issue. Michael Green says this, Faith is what brings us into contact with Jesus, even if that faith is full of error and inadequacy. It can avail so long as it is located in Jesus. The faith may be a last resort. It was with Jairus, wasn't it? It may be superstitious, It probably was with the woman who was bleeding. It may be theologically deficient, as it was for both of them. But if it is placed in Jesus, it binds the sinner and the saviour together. And that is what he came to bring about. Now, I suppose that sits along Jesus' comment about faith as small as a mustard seed that can be effective. These two miracles are remarkable in what was achieved. But some of the words used by Jesus 
in each of the healings shows that he was pointing to deeper truths, more profound truths than mere healing. He told the woman who touched him, your faith has made you well. Now the Greek word used for make you well is normally used as rescued or saved in a spiritual sense. Conversion, if you like, salvation. Effectively, it seems to be saying, your faith has healed both your physical condition and your spiritual condition. Likewise, when Jesus takes the little girl's hand and Matthew simply says, she got up, the Greek word means she arose, a word that is used in resurrection. So we have both salvation and resurrection being pointed to. Here's the new, the kingdom of God coming in the way that Jesus was talking. These are the perfect illustrations for him after the conversation he was having in the ver verses before our passage. He was using these healings to point to the fact that he was more than just a preacher and teacher. He was the Messiah, come to make all things new, come to break down barriers in human society, and above all else, to achieve salvation for all those who reach out and touch him, even for those whose faith is limited or defective, as that quote had it, as long as we connect with Jesus. In John's Gospel, Jesus is quoted as saying, I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. That's John chapter 10, verse 10. Yes, he gave life back to both of these people, both the woman and the girl. But he came to bring more than that physical life because they were going to die again at the natural end of their lives. He came to bring them eternal life as he comes to bring it to us. They both show, both of those events show that Jesus is the Lord and giver of life. That was the very purpose of his coming, to connect with us and through faith to give us life to the full with him. Amen. As we draw near to communion now, so we come to the words first of the Nicene Creed. Together, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, universal, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. When I come to the peace, uh, there'll be a short pause at the end of it for you to greet those around you, or, or if you're on your own, to perhaps offer your thanks to God for friends and loved ones near and far. The peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you. Let us share with one another a sign of peace.
We now come to the Eucharistic prayer and its joyful opening responses to our risen Lord. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed right, it is our duty and our joy at all times and in all places to give you thanks and praise. Holy Father, Heavenly King, Almighty and Eternal God. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in your tender mercy gave your only Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there by his one oblation of himself once offered a full, perfect and sufficient sacrifice, oblation and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world, he instituted and in his holy gospel commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until he comes again. Hear us, merciful Father, we humbly pray, and grant that we, receiving these gifts of your creation, this bread and this wine, according to your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood, who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body because we all share in one bread. Draw near with faith. Eat and drink in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. We now come to the distribution. The body of Christ, broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you, keep you in eternal life. So we come to our prayer after communion together. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise 
that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us, so we and all your children shall be free, and the whole earth live to praise your name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, in a moment, we're going to come to our final hymn in which we will take our offering in support of the work and witness of our church family in this parish and through our mission partners and other organizations much further afield. Thank you for joining us. It's been so meaningful to remember the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. I trust your faith has been strengthened by this morning's message and this act of remembrance. Do use the social media or send an email with your greetings to perhaps and your best wishes or spiritual thoughts or encouragements to others. Um, also, do send in to our office any testimonies or encouragements you've had or answers to prayer. It's always lovely to hear what God is doing in your life. Uh, if you're outside the UK, do uh, mention the country that you're in. Um, if you're able to do so, we are a global community, but we are one in Christ. Our final blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and those you love now and evermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm.